Hello and welcome to the Swim Brief. The Swim Brief is brought to you by my employer, Jersey Wahoo Swim Club, who um, graciously lend me space and equipment to do this. You may notice uh, if you're watching the YouTube version of this, I'm in a different space. Uh, just uh, had to uh, switch studio spaces due to some technical difficulties. Um, today, I am joined by Brian Tremel. Brian is the director of the recently released documentary, The Water Is My Sky. And he's also a former Division I swimmer. He's a coach. He's a swimming fan. And so I thought I'd bring him on here to talk about the Olympics, of course, because we're, we're mid-Olympics. We're right in the thick of it right now. We're going to have a conversation about that for a little while. And then uh, we're going to talk about the documentary, which I have recently just re-watched uh, in full. And so it's all fresh in my mind. Um, and I think people who listen to this podcast um, I'll just get the spoilers out of the head right away. If you listen to this podcast, you're really going to love this documentary. Um, I loved watching it. There's a lot of really good stuff in there for a lot of different people that are around the sport of swimming. But first, um, Brian, how has your uh, how has your experience been watching uh, these Olympics so far? It's been very uh, interesting. I think just. Um... It, it just feels like a weird meet. I'm trying to figure out what it would be like to be on deck there um, yeah. and to just put myself in the position of what these swimmers must be going through to be so far from home. I have to imagine for a lot of them, it's maybe the first meet they've ever done where there's no spectators. I mean, mm -hmm. not, I mean, you know, swimmers can grow up and, and there's a meet here or there where the parents may not be there, but I mean, a meet of this magnitude did not have any support system other than your teammates uh, just an incredible challenge. And I think you're, and then on top of that, there's swimming finals in the morning, um, you know, just due to the, the um, constraints from NBC and they're wanting to show it during prime time here in the States. And so it's just so many obstacles um, in, in their way. And so I think, you know, I've just really, I've been blown away by a lot of the performances. And on top of that, I think you're seeing a really interesting mix of the veterans uh, with, with some of these really young up and coming talented swimmers. Um, there's kind of like a collision course of, there's always that changing of the guard every Olympics it seems, but at this one, it seems to be a little bit more telling. Um, as we saw, I think most recently with last night's finals with uh, Ryan Murphy and Lily King. Yeah. Um, last night's finals was like the changing of the guards finals. Like really, and, and almost you can feel I, 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 my mind starts racing with the, like, what was the impact of this meet being delayed a year, you know, yeah. how different would these results have been a year ago? And then I, I had the experience of, I watched the first night with my boss, who's an Irish national and um, uh, another guy that I work with a little bit younger, um, probably closer to your age, American guy. And, you know, first night, everything seemed for USA fans, everything seemed business as usual. It was like, oh, like we have all this worry, existential dread about how our team's going to do leading up to it. And then we get to the Olympics and uh, we just outswim everybody and here it goes. And a few days in, it doesn't feel like that anymore. Mm -hmm. It feels like um, it's not business as usual. If Ryan Murphy doesn't have an A plus swim, he's going to get a bronze medal. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if Lily King doesn't perform at her absolute best, she's going to find herself back there. So um, it's definitely interesting. What, what, what have been some of the highlights for you thus far? And I'll, uh, I've got a few that I, I told you ahead of time I wanted to discuss, but I'm curious as to what, what's been a highlight for you. Certainly. I mean, so many good races. And I, I, I personally, I, I'm someone who I just appreciate great racing. And I think that uh, as even as an American that uh, the women's 400 free was just fun to watch. I think yep. the, the way that Titmus paced it and then just attacked, I believe it was the turn going into, or it was the turn uh, for the 300, with the hundred mm -hmm. remaining. And that's when Rowdy started to, he could just tell it was coming and you could just see her pick that tempo up those like final 10 meters into the turn. Yep. Uh, and just so for her to have that composure on that stage, and it's not necessarily to say anything was wrong with, Katie Ledecky's uh, racing strategy either. I mean, she's the best in the world, the best ever for a, a reason. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, she, she and her coaches decided that's what they were going to do. They were going to go out after it. And I think it speaks to as well as what happened, you know, last night with Murphy and King is that it's not that 
there's anything wrong with them. They just, they weren't the best on that day. Mm-hmm. So I think you're seeing a lot of that. Um, so that 400 free was certainly a highlight. Um, I really enjoyed last night, Lydia Jacoby. How can you not like that story? I mean, when they cut to the, the fans watching at home, just yeah. that, that's, that's what the Olympics are all about. Um, yeah. So those are two for me. Yeah, it felt like maybe every single person that lives in Seward, Alaska was uh, right. in the same room watching yeah. that. I'd have to get to Wikipedia to, to check. I know it is. a uh, People who know what's about Seward, Alaska, yes, I, it probably is a few more people living there than were in that room, but it felt like that. Um, uh, yeah, the, to, to get back to the 400 free, I think um, I agree with you that, I mean, Ledecky probably swam uh, tactically in many ways, the race that she wanted to swim, you know, I saw it very well pointed out. That's her second fastest 400 free of all time. Um, mm-hmm. and if you go back to when she was just on the ascent, I mean, I watched a lot of these races because, uh, as I like to say on this podcast, I'm a, uh, Olympic sports bigamist. Um, and I have, a, a Danish citizenship as well. So I always cheer for the Danes. Um, mm-hmm. One of my favorite swimmers of all time is Lotta Fries. Um, Lotta Fries most notably had a couple of distance races with Ledecky where they both swam under world record time. And in those mm. races, basically, Fries had a very similar strategy to Ledecky, which was, I'll just get out there and hold, mm-hmm. and hold on. But she couldn't hold on quite as well as Ledecky. And Ledecky, for such a long time, has been able to just sort of steamroll the competition mm-hmm. by just getting right. impossibly far ahead. And it's so demoralizing for everybody yeah. else. Um, and so mentally, you could just see that Titmus um, knew that if she executed her strategy, she would be able to maintain, keep herself in the race enough that she could execute that back half. And to me, it's really interesting to see because when, when somebody's just dominating like that, you'll just read a million things about why they're so dominant, why her stroke is perfect, why everything she does is perfect. Her training is perfect. And then once you get into a really tight competitive situation and you see two people next to each other, you can start to see little things. You talk about that turn. And that's something I discussed with, with uh, my friends who are watching my swim coaching friends who are watching a lot. I could almost see at the same time that um, Titmus was just accelerating into that, Ledecky had one of those, I don't, know, I don't know how to describe it, like kind of a defensive turn where you're trying to hold on. You know that you're going to be a little bit better underwater and she was better underwater. And so you're just trying to like load up onto it mm-hmm. without too much effort, but it actually hurt her because, you know, Titmus had all the momentum there Um And so it's just, you know, it's, uh, it, it's more fun to watch even when, when you've got two people just producing, uh, great, great stuff. Um, and if we get back to the Jacoby swim, um, I love it stylistically too, because I think we've had this trend, um, breaststroke is my favorite stroke. Um, Mm. we've had this trend towards, um, everybody in my opinion sort of swimming breaststroke like a like a hyperactive bunny you know what i mean Max yes. stroke rate like just go 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 tiny little kick heel speed bang bang and um jacoby is just kind of steaming along she's, she's yeah. she, <laughs> like there's a lot of stuff that i think is not what what maybe people are teaching for breaststroke right now works for her works for her body and she just kind of kind of kept going um, all the way into the wall and that consistency uh, that she had meant that she didn't peter it out all the end. She was swimming her almost her fastest there seemingly at the finish um, and able to get a touch. And um, you know, that's one of those things like, I guess I'm married to a casual swimming fan. So this morning she's like, Hey, any highlights? I said, well, there was a girl who went, you know, about 110 in the hundred breaststroke a year ago and she won the Olympics in 104 and she just sort of like, opened her jaw like that's cool stuff um absolutely and that speaks to the the delay as well right you know right a year ago (laughs) she wouldn't have been ready probably Uh, you (laughs) would think (laughs) yeah Yeah. uh she probably you know would have been like trying to qualify for trials trying to get herself to the meet so yes it does change a lot of things here's another thing i want to talk about you because you're a coach 
Um, and now we have even additional hindsight in this because Britain won, went one, two in the men's 200 free last night. The decision to leave the two best swimmers um, off the preliminary um, men's four by 100 relay, Britain misses the final. Um, and they, you know, by all accounts had a legitimate chance to either win or medal in that relay. Um, I've got plenty of opinions, but wh what do you think about that? Goodness. Uh, certainly a hindsight plays a huge factor because it's so easy for us to be armchair experts and sit back and say, well, clearly they made an error and they didn't know that, you know, the four guys they stood up to swim on that relay were, we're not going to be able to make the A final. Um, I think that, you know, it coaching requires a certain level of trust in your athletes and there's a certain level of, level of helplessness too. Um, I would imagine that the coaches had the full belief in those four athletes to be able to get the job done and get to the A final. But then you step up at the Olympic games, the biggest stage that a lot of those guys have probably ever seen. Uh, and, it falters and you see it every year in like NCAAs or any type of high school conference meet, you know, one disqualification, one slip up here. It's just the nature of the sport. But I certainly think that, you know, it, I'm not the biggest international swimming expert, so I can't speak to the experience of the guys that had on that prelim relay. I think, uh, I think if I'm an American coach, I feel quite a bit better about leaving the top two off the prelims because if you've made the top six at U.S. trials, you've right. proven yourself on that level. You've more than likely had some really big level meet experience elsewhere, either in college or maybe even internationally. So they're pretty battle tested. I would think that internationally, I would have to imagine that might be a little bit of a different conversation of really needing to just lay it all out and put, you know, put, uh, nothing to chance when it comes to that. So kind yeah. of a, I didn't exactly commit to an answer there, but yeah. <laughs> all right. I'm going to commit to some, I'm going to commit okay. to some answers and then you can get a chance to respond. I mean, I do think again, acknowledging hindsight. Um, that's just the, that's just the way it is in sports. You know, like I, I'm not there making the decisions. I just get to sit here and second guess decisions. Um, I used to say this all the time to, my boss at Georgia Tech when I was when I was a coach there and I was a really young assistant coach and she'd get frustrated, you know, because um, swimmers would be second guessing her decisions or one of the one of us coaches would be second. I said, that's that's what comes with being the boss. Do you know what I mean? Like, again, mm -hmm. I think coach wise, we can get into the conversation. I think things should be done sort of in private. You shouldn't be second guessing your boss in public. But um you know, the, the higher up you are on a hierarchy, the more people get to say, without, without having any accountability for the decisions, people get to say, well, that was, that was a mistake. You know what I mean? So I do think, that said, I do think it was a mistake. And it speaks to something I think you, you hinted at, which is that the, the margins are just really tough. And th this is maybe changing for the non-American countries and, 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 and maybe not so changing so much changing for the non-American countries, but changing for America, where it's going to become, I think, less and less reliable that we can put those three through six uh, relay swimmers and count on making it into a final because the depth in relays has really, really improved abroad. Um, and so they ran into that a little bit. Um, I don't think, I was trying to consider were they in one of these situations where they had to swim some of the swimmers because as you as you've probably heard in the broadcast, if you brought relay only swimmers to the meet, um, you know, you have to swim them on a relay, which I think has created a unique tactical mm -hmm. situation for some teams that maybe would like some flexibility to not swim people like you cannot, you know, because of COVID, right. if you brought somebody, you have to swim them. Um, and then, you know, my insight, I, I coached in Denmark for four years. So I got a little bit of a peak into a smaller NGB. And I'd say Britain is not a small NGB, but they're, they're smaller than America or China or sure. uh, Russia or whatever, you know, and, and I'm hearing it actually in this broadcast, it's incredibly hard to come away with the Olympics from the Olympics with medals. It's mm -hmm. really, really hard. And the organizations are built around that as a measuring stick. Okay. Denmark, you know, can, they have swimmers that can have the swim of their lives 
and get fourth, okay? But when that comes back to the Danish Olympic Committee, they don't go, well, really good job getting fourth. Do you know what I mean? They are interested yeah. in medals. And so there's a part of this where uh, that's really hard to crack, which is they go, okay, do we perhaps jeopardize there are two guys in the 200 free instead of sending them home we keep them here for another 90 minutes we give them another swim right and uh they have to wake up tomorrow morning and swim the 200 um again do we uh do we jeopardize you know uh, our chances maybe later with an extra swim for winning this four by 200 relay, which we're favored in, you know, or do we just try to like get these medals that we feel pretty confident we can get. And, um, you know, I'm hearing all these countries, like they go, you don't even think about it. When, um, when Kolesnikov won last night, how long it's been since the Russian man won a gold medal at the Olympics, mm-hmm. you just think, oh, yeah, they probably, something happened Here, back there, in 2008. Yeah. No, 1996, you know, right. <laughs> since, since Popov was in his prime and Pankratov, right? So um, you can imagine on the other end of this how thin the margins are and how high the pressure is to just get the medals that you have the best chance of winning. And I do think that influences the, the decision. The last thing I think is I'm, I would be really curious as to, and I will never find this out, but as a coach, I'm really curious as to how the decision was made, right? Was this something where the coaches went, look, you know, this is the priority. You guys are not swimming on this relay. And the swimmers had no input in it. Were these swimmers going, hey, coach, I don't know if it's a good idea for me to swim on this relay, you know, just looking at my full program. Was it some mix of the two? Um, That stuff's really interesting because I think we've all found ourselves in that situation, right? You know, and, uh, and especially if you're coaching young kids, you're probably found yourself more in the situation of somebody begging out of a race because, oh, no, like, I don't want to do that 400 IM because I got the 100 free right afterwards, coach, and I want to do well on the 100 free. And please scratch me, you know, (laughs) and, and uh, so we've all, we've all um, encountered the age group version of that. Um, And I would be very curious to find out how similar it is up at that level. Right. And, and as a coach at that level, what is your priority? Is it the, the team medal count? Is it getting these individuals to hit their individual goals? And from the swimmer perspective, if, if someone from a smaller NGB, like does the concept of team, fit in the same way it does in this country we you know in america we prioritize you know swimming for the team and you got to do everything you can for the team and maybe some of these swimmers have just not been exposed to that before and all they really you know their top priority for their entire career has been themselves and now they're being asked to sacrifice for a prelim relay yeah i I can't speak to that i don't know what yet but i think that that conversation of who how the decision was made is absolutely fascinating yeah. Because of that dilemma of uh, how it fits into the bigger picture. Because are the coaches looking out for their own self-interest? Like, are there is their job on the line? Uh, and then these athletes, you know, this is the once every four years, this time five years. It's their one chance to really cash in right. on their opportunity, too. Um, I think in a vacuum, if I'm a smaller NGB, I... I I, correct me if I'm wrong on my history. I believe it was in 2004 when South Africa won the four by one. And yeah. They ran the same lineup prelim final. Yeah. And they were top seed. Uh, obviously every situation is unique, but I love, I love that mentality. If I'm not a, a superpower who it just perennially has been in the top three vying for a medal, every Olympics in that event, I love the idea of just, putting your cards down on the deck and saying, these are our four best come and get us. And there's some, there's a certain confidence to that. Yeah. Um, And I think that that could have gone a long way uh, in Great Britain's favor if they had gone that way. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree with you hundred percent. I would, I, I, you know, again, from my armchair, I don't actually don't have arms on the chair. So (laughs) my arms feel very heavy. Um, I would, uh, I, I, 
I think you want to be aggressive and confident like that. Um, and, you know, I think the message would be to the swimmers like, hey, we've been preparing for this the whole way, right? We, were, we, we, we trained you and got you fit enough to where you can, you're up to this challenge, you know? Um, I can remember being at a meet and we had, um, this could kind of a different situation for Georgia Tech, but we had a swimmer that was struggling and one of the assistant coaches, you know, they wanted to ask the swimmer like, hey, do you think that they're really ready to swim this relay? I said, don't ask that, you know, when they're struggling, who's going to say, like, what are they going to say, right? They're either going to like, you're, you're going to crush them psychologically as they go, no, I'm not ready. I don't know, you know, or they're going to be, be faking it for you. Like you as a coach communicate to them, like, hey, I'm gonna put you on this relay and I think you can do really well, you know, like, um, and yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a fascinating situation. I, I do think, you know, there's a part of this that, that you mentioned, I, I can confirm for you again, having been in Denmark, the, the route to qualifying for the Olympics is so different um, than we have here. You know, you, a lot of these swimmers, basically they have, they may have, and, and I'm borrowing from somebody else um, in saying this, they may have high level competitive experience, but they don't, what they're missing in a lot of these countries is high level racing experience, you mm -hmm. know? So they've, they've been to a lot of meets where you have to swim very fast to qualify, or you have to swim very fast to make it into a semi or a final or whatever, but they're just missing a lot of those opportunities that we get very naturally in the U S where you show up to the meet, beat that person. Do you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. um, and there's always somebody like, if you're very good, um, if you're Pernilla Blume in uh, Denmark, you know, who won the 50 free in 2016, you haven't swum a competitive 50 free domestically for half a decade. It's just right. not, it's just not been there for you. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have to be very actually conscientious about uh, picking where you're going to compete and, and setting some stuff up so that you don't lose some of that racing edge um, that again, also very well built into our college system since there's such a heavy focus um, on racing there. Okay. Um, any last uh, Olympic observations before we get into uh, water is my sky. Uh, no, I think I could see, you know, team USA um, kind of at like a bit of a crossroads, it seems like, but I think that everything, everything I've seen in post-race interviews, you know, it's exactly what you want to see from the athletes, um, yep. you know, always acting with class. And I think that, yeah, I think that we're going to, in the aftermath of these games, I think that we as a sport could really sit down and have some major takeaways uh, in terms of the mental aspect, the mental health, psychological health, um, you know, figuring out what's really important in our sport and, um, you know, hopefully steer in the direction a little bit, a little bit more away from those uh, extrinsic, extrinsic rewards uh, yeah. and looking a little bit more closely at, you know, that enjoyment and just uh, the, you know, satisfaction we can get from competing and, and trying to be, be our best. Yeah. Yeah, again, I, um, observations from a non-swim uh, junkie I was watching last night with my wife, and uh, we got to the Murphy race, and of course, they had that intro with the letters. And, um, yeah, how cool yeah, is that? Yeah, so cool. Um, but, you know, of course, <laughs> right after we're done watching it, she goes, she just turns to me, she goes, does Aaron Pierce all have a normal life? Does he have like a good normal life? And I go, I have no idea, honey. I hope so. You know, like, and uh, um, I was just, you know, that reaction stuck with me to think like, gosh, I have never before considered whether Aaron Pearsall, who I watched swim, you know, a, a seemingly a million fast backstroke races. How is he doing now? What's his life like now? Is he happy, right, with what's going on? And it is quite important, actually, to what we do um, that uh, that the, you know, we, we talk about all the time that the, the positive experience of sport is something that stays with you for a lifetime. Um, it has to actually manifest in reality. Okay. That's a perfect segue into talking about this movie, which I was telling you right before we got on air, um, absolutely, uh, brought me to tears, um, 
right towards the end. Um, and I, I don't think, you know, this is a documentary. So all the stuff that happened in it, you know, you, it's not like there are spoilers for it, but there, there's a, um, I'm watching uh, Tom Wilkins' father. You have footage in there of him hugging Tom Wilkins after he gets, uh, well, then I'm going to start crying talking about it right now, uh, after he wins a bronze medal at the Olympics. And you can just see the emotional experience um, of a parent. I'm a parent. I have two, two children and I'm immediately picturing myself at some day, you know, whatever <laughs> it is, um, big achievement for my kid and all the stuff that uh, comes before that. So this is, a, this is emotionally affecting movie. I, I, I guess my, curious, uh, my curiosity here is um, where did you get the idea to make this film? Like at what point and at what point did it become a film? Um, because I, I've just been watching it. I'm guessing at some point you just had some of this stuff, but maybe it wasn't going to be a movie, right? Mm, that's a good distinction. I think it, there's a moment in the film where Tom Wilkins talks about where hoping to be in the Olympics, it, it was a dream and then it became a goal and that distinction yep. between those two things. So I can yeah. say, uh, it, it, truthfully, this goes back about 20 years because in 2001, um, I had... Well, two, uh, starting in the year 2000 was the first Olympics I remember watching. I was yep. a 10, 10 or 11 years old in the Sydney games um, and was just really getting hooked on swimming, like right around that point. I started year round swimming and everything. And so I was video recording the trials on VHS and, and memorizing Rowdy's commentary. Like I was really, really into it. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, and then in 2001, my coach, um, how many times this... did you watch Misty Hyman's 200 fly then? Oh, so many. That's a, that's a top <laughs> race for me. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I think I may be at, I'm at maybe a hundred, but if you had it on VHS, then you might've done it more than that. I think you and I are in the triple digit club, yeah. but we might be yeah. the only two, but, or maybe the Hyman family too. Yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> if I was Misty Hyman, I'd watch it every day, but you know, right. Just, I just wake up to it. No. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so 2000 games, you know, f starting to familiarize myself with all the stars. And, uh, and then in 2001, my coach came to me and said, Hey, there's this book that just came out called gold in the water. Yes. And I really think you should read it. So I was, I was, you know, even just 11 or 12 years old, but even then he said, you know, this will be appropriate for you. And I just, I just vividly remember him telling myself and a couple of my other teammates, like this book tells it like it really is. And this is what, if you go down this path, of year round swimming for the next, you know, 10 to 12 years, this is, this book has everything that you will encounter. And I, so I read it, it's by PH Mullen and it's my favorite book to this day. Uh, I can quote it, uh, you know, on the spot for you. Um, it's, and it's I still, an, I'm, I'm with you hundred percent. It's an incredible book. Uh, and I almost feel like this movie is like the spiritual successor to Gold in the Water. And it has a connection, right? It covers Tom Wilkins. You read a lot about him in Gold in the Water. Um, you right. have P.H. Mullen in this documentary talking about some stuff that he covered in, in Gold in the Water. Um, sorry, go on. No, it's totally fine. Yeah, so the from the moment I read Gold in the Water and then the moment it kind of lined up when I became interested in filmmaking in middle school and high school, I just always carried that book with me as like, this would make a great movie because for those who don't know, the gold in the water tells the story of the Santa Clara swim club in the late nineties. There was a pro group from Stanford that trained at Santa Clara from 99 leading up to 2000. They took a whole group to trials yep. and they had, uh, I think four swimmers end up, well, three swimmers made an A final and then Kurt Grote, who was the 1998 world champion, did, didn't end up making the finals due to an injury. Um, but essentially, a, a, in that time, that was like the pro group in this country. And, yeah. and so the book tells the story of that whole group, and there's so much nuance to every single different character. And it's just, I cannot re recommend it highly enough. So after you watch The Water's My Sky, go buy Gold in the Water. Uh, and um, so I just always thought this would make a great, movie. So then I end up swimming for the University of Iowa and I was a film student uh, and I was in a screenwriting class and one of my professors had asked us for what some ideas we might have for like writing a script just to learn how to do this. And I ca came up with two ideas that I thought were brilliant. 
And then the third <laughs> one, I couldn't come up with a third. So he, so I just put down, oh, I could just maybe like, maybe the idea of adapting Gold in the Water as a script would work. I threw down the synopsis of the book. And then he, the professor came back to me and said, this is so interesting as a movie. He read like the prologue to the book and was just like, yeah. there's, you could do some cool things with like being underwater and how you can't see during a race and all this. He got really into it. So then I got really into it. Uh, and I was writing a script based off of this book, not really thinking it was going to go anywhere, but it was just fun at the time. And then when I was at Iowa, one of my teammates, uh, just by complete luck, uh, something aligned in the stars in the universe. And he was in my dorm room one day and he saw the book gold in the water on my desk. And he said, Hey, is that book about uh, Tom Wilkins and the Santa Clara club? And I said, yeah. And he said, that's uh, pretty cool. You know, my uh, Tom is my cousin. And I just was <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, I guess that answers yeah, the question of how you were able to get introduced to Tom Wilkins and get yeah. him in the documentary. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So that uh, was a, just a really wild connection. I don't know what brought us both together. I'm from Michigan. Tom's cousin is this a good friend of mine. He's from uh, Connecticut and we both ended up swimming in Iowa and that was the connection. So I graduated from Iowa and didn't have much direction and uh, at the time I had, I had started interning for a group of local independent documentary filmmakers who live in Iowa city and still live in Iowa city. And I had told them about the script I was writing and just the story, the kind of the bullet points of it. And I was like, yeah, it's such a good Hollywood. Like there's, there's heartbreak, there's, you know, triumph, there's everything you could want in a sports movie. And they were like, sounds like it's a documentary. Like you should maybe think about trying to pursue this as a, a nonfiction piece. Um, so based on that, I kind of just dove into it, no pun intended. Um, so I originally got in touch with Tom and PH and got their blessing. Uh, so the original idea was to turn Gold in the Water into a film. It okay. was We were going to do an ESPN 30 for 30 retelling of what happened in that time, uh, kind of recreation type of uh, a film. And we as you kind of alluded to, it was kind of like we were capturing bits and pieces here and there. We knew we had the great moments. Like we knew that the 2000 Olympic trials were going to be just an incredible moment, 2000 Olympics. But when we uncovered everything else and we got in touch with everyone in the book was happy to participate. Um, but it, there's no footage from back then. Right. Like the author was not recording any of this on a video camera unfortunately because if you've read the book there's some really wild practice scenes I know. <laughs> but ultimately we kind of sat there and said okay if, the, if this is going to be the only storyline that we portray it's more of a short 20 to 30 minute yeah. piece which could be nice but being the high achiever mindset that I have that wasn't good enough <laughs> so um so from there, we were like, what if we blend the idea of doing a traditional documentary that's telling something that's already happened and then blending it with what's called a verite documentary, so real life. We like follow some actual swimmers as they're going through the process of what, you know, of their career trajectory. And so it was around that time as well, I made a, another crazy connection of meeting Connor Yeager. He uh, was his roommate, his freshman year at Michigan is my, was one of my teammates from high school. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just met him in 2012, actually before he made the 2012 Olympic team. And when I met him, my high school friend was like, Hey, you guys can talk about gold in the water because would you know it? Connor here is from the same hometown as Tom Wilkins. And that's, so we talked about that for a little while. And that was just like another, just crazy. We all have those stories in the swim world of being so small and so when we were confronting this issue with not having enough footage from Tom's era, myself and a few others who were kind of working on the film at the time said like, well, what if we like approach Connor and then Connor could kind of speak to some of the things that Tom describes happening as he made that transition from collegiate swimming to pro swimming. And that was right as Connor was graduating from Michigan and going to pursue a, a spot on the 2016 team. Um, so that was, that was that. And, and we just kind of naturally decided at the same time, we wanted a female voice in the film and someone who could represent the, the 99 percenters of, of the elite swimmers in America who, you know, chase that level of perfection, but 
you know, fall short and don't end up making the Olympics. And so that was how we kind of rounded out our story. (laughs) Yeah. One of the best lines you, in the entire movie, you have Don Kimball, um, Taylor Garcia's coach who sadly passed away, I guess a year or two ago, a little over a year ago, a little over a year ago. Um, and he, you know, he says on there in, in regards to her, you know, you describe he's having this conversation with her parents. This is what it looks like, you know? And then he says, yeah, 99% of um, sort of elite swimmers make the same sacrifices as Olympians. They just don't get to be Olympians. Right. And it's, yeah. it's one of those things that just hits you over the head, like a two by four listening to it. And I think it's presented really well because, you know, I think somebody could listen to it and go, Oh, well, isn't that so sad, you know, and another person um, might listen to it and go, well, maybe, you know, maybe honestly, all those sacrifices are worth it regardless of whether you make an Olympic team, you know? So I think uh, it leaves it to the viewer to do that. And I think as a nice, um portrayal it's one of the things when i watched the trailer i was like i don't i the crazy thing is as much as i follow swimming i had kind of forgotten uh, about who taylor garcia was you know i'm sure that i had seen her in some junior national results and then i just sort of like moved on this that and the other thing um because she wasn't the best of the best um and you know, I, I, so I think it's a great story to include in there. And she's, um, if I could uh, maybe step on your explanation a little bit, she's from the same hometown as you. So you're both from Holland, yes. Michigan. Was was Don Kimball your coach as well? He was, yep. And he's the mm-hmm. one who told you to read yep. Golden Water. Okay, so so yeah. um, that sort of brings it full circle here. Indeed, yep. Yeah, um, yeah, Taylor's, Taylor's family is a, you know, old friend of, of ours and, 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 I approached the family, I think kind of as she had made trials in 2012 and done really well. And then, but was still like kind of just on the cusp of that, like next jump. And then we happened to be at, as portrayed in the film, we were at junior nationals in 2013, where she ended up having a big time drop and then becoming zero. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's what makes me feel guilty about not remembering her because I thought (laughs) that is so fast um, Mm -hmm. for a, for a junior swimmer to swim. Um, and, um, so you have these three parallel stories, um, I guess parallel in the way that, that, um, you know, you're trying to get some of the same experiences, but maybe people at different stages, you know, somebody who's, who's looking back on it, somebody who's really on the, in the thick of, of making an Olympic team. And then there's perspective of, um, somebody who didn't make uh, an Olympic team, but still sort of put all of the work and sacrifice out there. Um, what, why did you choose to, uh, you know, sort of weave the different parts together uh, over the course of, I guess the movie's about 75 minutes. Um, so we get like, you know, five to 10 minutes of each story and then it sort of moves sequentially uh, back and forth. Uh, how did you come to that decision? I think what I think it derived from the we wanted to make a distinction between a more traditional character driven film as opposed to kind of a maybe more of like a meditation or even just like a love letter to the sport of swimming. Right. I think some of the other swimming documentaries that have come out in the past few years have all, all been great, like nothing bad to say about those, but it's kind of more like this is Ryan Lochte or this is Missy Franklin. Uh yeah. And this is exactly what they're going through. And what I think is nice about, in a, in a way, it's funny, I think Connor Yeager, he, he never was someone who was really going to open up his entire life to us, but I don't hold that against him in any way. And I think through that, it kind of became more a look of just, he is representative of what a lot of different swimmers are going through. So I think that that's a, yeah. a, a, a specific example, a way of saying, you know, I don't think... I, this isn't a Tom Wilkins story. We're taking Tom's story to demonstrate some of the things you learn through swimming, like how you learn to be resilient. And through Taylor Garcia's story, we are learning that all those sacrifices can be worth it without that extrinsic metal reward at the end. And so I think that over time, 
came to the conclusion that the movie should be more about my relationship and what I wanted to say about why I love the sport of swimming and like why I wanted to give what I wanted to give back to it rather than saying this is a story about one individual person and you're going to learn every single thing about their life. Yeah. One thing I'm curious about, I, I've got a coaching question for you now as a coach to coach is that, um, you know, I, I think I first read this book probably around the same time as, as you did. Um, I'm a little bit older than you. Uh, so I was sort of about to embark on my coaching career. And one of the things that really struck me in watching the documentary was I think the first time I read Golden Water, um, I read all the Dick Jokum sections and I went, what a freaking maniac. I hope I never do anything like that guy. Even though I know like I admired the success and I admired, you know, how well some of the swimmers done. I thought, so stupid. He can't even write a different swim practice. And he's like torturing these. And it's so funny for me to revisit it. And even the part about rotating the through the practices, all of a sudden 37 year old me goes, actually, that kind of makes sense. Like that's, that's right. really smart to do. <laughs> did you yeah. like, did you go through a similar um, metamorphosis from reading the book to actually sitting there with Dick Jokum's revisiting some of this stuff? You know, I, as opposed to you, I think at that point in my life, when I read the book, I think I was a, I was a maniac too. <laughs> so I <laughs> so read that like, book and I said, awesome. I want to, yeah. I was like, can I move to Santa Clara? I want to do this. Like, I mean, Tom okay. Wilkins is my hero. And I'm, yeah. at that point I'm training for the 200 fly and 400 IM. And I just want to be, I want to be that okay. warrior. I want to be that person too. And yeah. then, yeah. And then you go through your career and you're just like, you can see I think you can see the genius behind it and the intention, but I think you can also see why it probably isn't, or definitely isn't for everybody and why it may have actually played a factor into some of the performance based struggles that Tom encountered with the 400 IM, because as it's, as it's portrayed in the film, essentially Dick Jokums wanted his swimmers to swim race pace every day so it's a bit you talk about usrpt like you know a bit ahead of its time but they were certainly not swimming the same amount of total yardage or anything like that as well, USRPT i think you would be i think you're revealing the dirty little secret which is that since the beginning of time there have been coaches right. that want yeah. their swimmers to swim race pace every day right exactly you know, there's exactly there's just been a new branding on it yeah exactly so but i think what stood what's made dick's program stand out is that yeah it was about i think like 16 to 20 workouts that he had and then you're just doing them and it's the same thing every Monday morning, same thing every Monday afternoon. So every week you're coming in and it's essentially the same. And it's like doing maybe like compared to like a weightlifting program, like you're the objective is to add weight every week from I bench this the first week, I want to bench a little bit more the next week. And uh, as any, if anyone, anyone who swam before, you know, that's not going to be the case. You can't just come in, do the same set every Monday and expect to drop time. But that was, that was still the mentality that the Dick's program kind of implemented into his swimmers was I want you to be comparing your best self to what your best self was last Monday to what it was the Monday before. So if a swimmer gets into a pattern of not showing improvement, you can see how slippery of a slope that might've been, uh, especially when you have the added pressure that Tom had on him where he's, going from the underdog to all of a sudden now being ranked number one in the world a few months before trials. So there's that added outside pressure coming in too. So I think that uh, the training is probably what got Tom there, uh, but it's also simultaneously what might've, you know, I could speculate might have played a role with his performance, but I'd I'd have to ask him that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 I agree with you and I can see how things start, could start rolling downhill. The, the other part though that, that I'm now reconsidering is on the other hand, it gives you this window to go when, when the practice is changing all the time, sometimes you can miss a pattern like that. That's developing, you know, you know, and this is right. like, it's right in your face go, okay. Yeah. It's been mm-hmm. a while since you had your best possible practices. What is going on? Like, let's right. get into this. Let's figure out 
um, where there's a interruption in the process because things have been simplified enough that we can very easily measure whether or not you're doing better than you used to. Um, sure. And uh, I do think somehow, somehow that's the advantage. I, I think I'm probably, as I get older, I, I'm realizing how much at the beginning of my coaching career, I tried to make the practice entertaining for the swimmers when um, that's not necessarily the point. The point is to help them be their best. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, sometimes I like, I, I struggle with this. Um, my, my background is I've, I've got a master's in, in positive psychology. And sometimes in, you know, talking about what I do, I thought, don't use the term positive psychology because, you know, people will, they'll form something immediately in their mind and it's not what you want them to think. And um, so just use some different terminology to get around it. And then I come back to, no, I have to use it and I have to educate people about what it means or I'll be stuck in this situation the whole time. I feel the same way looking at the practices. It goes like, oh yeah, you know, gosh, you got to make this practice engaging for the swimmers because um, otherwise you're, you're not going to get the best out of them. And then I go, wait a second, why don't I teach them how this practice can be engaging <laughs> for mm -hmm. them, right? Even though it's the same thing we did last Monday, you know, they get a chance to work on it again and um, see where there's room for improvement on the last time that they did it. And we, and we don't have to spend a bunch of redundant time, me, you know, teaching them how to do a whole new type of practice. Um, so I think there's a lot there. I can see that playing really well too with uh, older adolescent swimmers too, yeah. because it, as you would know with your background and I'm actually pursuing a master's degree in sports psychology at the moment. So oh, nice. kind of speak to the similar, uh, similar um, training and background there, but I think, you know, getting swimmers to connect to their, why, why am I doing this yeah. uh, is really important. And so I think some coaches may rebel against that of being like, well, I'm the coach. They need to just do what I say. They need to trust me. Um, I think we're maybe missing a little bit of, it's not a, it's not an obedience or trusting thing. It's more of just tapping into some of that inner motivation. It's, it's easy to be motivated when you're 12 years old and you're dropping time every meet that you go yeah. to. But if you're 15 or 16 and haven't seen a significant or a meaningful time drop in a long time. And yeah, we, our sport is redundant. It's monotonous. It's, there's no way. That, and, and like, as to your point, you don't need to work around that by being, overly exciting or engaging with your practices, we still need to do the work. Yeah. But if we can get them to buy into the purpose of the work and how it speaks to, it can speak to their development and these number of ways we're hoping it leads to a best time, but also it's, it's teaching you X, Y, and Z about determination and discipline and um, you know, any number of other different things. I think we can keep our swimmers more satisfied, but should be part of our job. Yeah. And I think, again, to, to, to bring it back to the documentary, I think probably um, one of the th reasons, uh, the other reasons are so emotionally affected specifically by um, Tom Wilkins' story is that, um, yeah, it's one thing to read Gold in the Water and read about him at, at his athletic peak and all these crazy workouts and all the struggles he had competitively. And now we get to see him as an adult with kids um, mm -hmm. what is his life like now? You know, what is, um, what is, what is the stuff that has carried through from that experience all the way up to today? And, um, for me, I thought this stuff is really valuable. I mean, I just like, one of the questions I, I thought about asking you, but now I'm just going to answer it myself is who is this movie for? And I just think like this movie is for coaches. I think there's great content in there for somebody who coaches the sport of swimming. There's great content. I would uh, like golden in the water. I think young swimmers like, like it was recommended to you young swimmers can watch this movie. There's a lot to learn from it. Um, I think it'd be great movie for parents of kids that are involved in uh, swimming because I think it represents really well um, fairly, but also quite positively the experience of, uh, of the sport of swimming. So um, uh, now I've answered the question, the movies for everybody. <laughs> so just I think, even I, if, even if you don't like swimming, watch it, you know? Yeah. I think one, one audience that I think we discovered that I didn't anticipate at the beginning, I think 
maybe if if you're not involved in the sport, I still think if you swam, if you swam at some point in your life, like you know, a retired swimmer or a master swimmer, looking back on your career, yeah. uh, it really is. Um, especially the latter third of the film, it is kind of more reflective of like looking back and saying like, what did I get from the sport? Um, so I think that that was an audience we, yeah, we didn't, didn't plan on, but I think it, it resonates well with that group too. So now looking forward, um, do you have plans for more swimming uh, cinematic content? Well, as I alluded to earlier, uh, just a moment ago, I'm, I'm in graduate school right now. I'm pursuing a master's in sport and performance psychology, as well as mental health counseling. So my intent awesome. is to continue. Thank you. <laughs> my intent is to, uh, is to work with athletes, uh, both on performance-based mental concerns, as well as clinically-based mental concerns. Um, and not strictly just athletes, the general population too, but, um, you know, as I worked on the film, I coached to support myself. I like coaching a lot. I don't see it as a full-time long-term career for myself. So I still wanted to work with athletes uh, in some capacity. And so I found this field that uh, is, is growing. And I think we've seen it's, it's an underserved um, avenue, I think, at this Absolutely. point. Absolutely. We need, we need like 100,000 more Brian Tremels <laughs> with the same. Seriously. We'll get I mean, started just, on that. Yeah. yeah. So just go ahead and start cloning yourself. Okay. Yep. Okay. And yeah. uh, get all those people to pursue the same thing because I think um, what you're talking about it's it, you, it's almost um, it's an understatement to say it's underserved. I mean, I think anybody that's yeah. following the sport knows that there is a tremendous um, there's just a tremendous need for more people, more qualified people uh, to get in there and uh, help athletes and fulfill this mission of. Um, making it a truly lifelong positive experience to participate in the sport of swimming. Um, yes, that is like, that's the thing. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So see it. So for the film, film side of things, um, I'm still committed to, I'm still full-time waters my sky. You know, it's, it's out now. Uh, the journey does not stop. I anticipate another year or two of promotion and hopefully I can use it to, then also promote what I want my future career to be within the mental performance and mental health fields. And yeah. um, I'll never say never on another film, but um, no plans as of the right. moment. And, it, and uh, I should not bury the lead. If people want to see the film, it's available on Vimeo, right? Um, Correct. Well, the film actually, uh, as of today, July 27th, we are out widely on um, a few platforms. So you can find us on iTunes and Apple TV, uh, Google Play, uh, YouTube, and, and Vimeo uh, is our, our host. You can also find it right on our website, waterismysky.com. Uh, and please go check it out. Yeah, highly <laughs> recommend it. Um, again, uh, just just make sure you get the Kleenex out when, uh, if, especially if you're like me, if you're a dad, when, when Tom Wilkins' dad hugs him, you, get, you make sure you have the full box um ready uh because it's it's a moment that uh the you it builds um really strongly towards that and uh, uh just ended up finding myself totally overwhelmed brian tremel thank you so much for joining me thanks for talking about some olympics thanks for making this documentary thanks for um pursuing what you're pursuing and it's been a pleasure talking to you thanks for having me on i'd be anxious to come back again soon <laughs>